This is chapter 29, Progressivism and the Republican Roosevelt from 1901 to 1912. Now, before we begin this chapter, it's important to remember we've just covered a couple of chapters of imperialism, but I want to bring it back to domestic issues for a moment and remind ourselves that 1893, remember the year 1893, it's a massive economic depression, a crash. It was known as the Great Depression until we have the other one in the 1930s. So 1893 heels of the Gilded Age are still part of the Gilded Age. We have the government seemingly in the hands of big business and vice versa, and the people are feeling left out. And so in the 1890s, we have the rise of the populists that we last talked about, and we also had the beginning of the question, should the government step in, and instead of having laissez-faire, hands-off, we have the beginning of the discussion of should the government take a role in the economy in helping improve people's lives. So chapter 29, Progressivism and the Republican Roosevelt, is a chapter about a reform era. Coming on the heels of the Gilded Age, we now have this reform era. And I'd like you to think of what other time in U.S. history was similar to the progressive reform era, or what what are some other reform eras? Uh, And specifically, what were the progressives waging war against? Here we go. Now, also keep in mind, internationally, we also are taking colonies. Uh, Philippines, Cuba is still kind of happening right now. But back home, here we go. Nearly 76 million Americans greeted the new century in 1900. Of them, almost one in seven was foreign-born. In the 14 years of peace that remained before the Great War of 1914 engulfed the globe, 13 million more migrants would carry their bundles down the gangplanks to the land of promise. Hardly had the 20th century dawned on the ethnically and racially mixed American people than they were convulsed by a reform movement, the likes of which the nation had not seen since the 1840s. The new crusaders, who called themselves progressive, waged war on many evils, notably monopoly, corruption, inefficiency, and social injustice. The progressive army was large, diverse, and widely deployed, but it had a single battle cry, strengthen the state. The real heart of the movement, explained one of the progressive reformers, was to use government as an agency of human welfare. So this is the moment where the government becomes the good guy, a force for good against the evils of corruption, monopoly, and inefficiency, and social injustice. Progressive roots. Now, as we read this, you should be able to uh, look at why progressives were challenging laissez-faire individualism, and what were some roots that would have led to a larger uh, movement. So you should be able to, at the end of this, name at least three specific people, ideas, movements that encouraged progressivism. Progressive roots. The groundswell of the new reformist wave went far back to the Greenback Labor Party of the 1870s and the populists of the 1890s, to the mounting unrest throughout the land as grasping industrialists concentrated more and more power in fewer and fewer hands. An outworn philosophy of hands-off individualism seemed increasingly out of place in the modern machine age. Social and economic problems were now too complex for intentionally feeble Jeffersonian organs of government. Progressive theorists were insisting society could no longer afford the luxury of limitless, let alone laissez-faire policy. The people, through government, must be substitute mastery for drift. Well before 1900, perceptive politicians and writers had begun to pinpoint targets for progressive attack. Bryan, Atkelg, and Populists loudly branded the bloated trusts with the stigma of corruption and wrongdoing. In 1894, Henry Demarest Lord Lloyd charged headlong into the Standard Oil Company with his book, Wealth Against the Commonwealth. Eccentric Thorstein Velbin assailed the new rich with his prickly pen in the theory of the leisure class in 1899, a savage attack on the predatory wealth and the conspicuous consumption. Other pen-wielding knights likewise entered the fray. The keen-eyed and keen-nosed Danish immigrant Jacob A. Rees, a reporter from the New York Sun, shocked middle-class Americans in 1890 with How the Other Half Lives. His account was a damning indictment of the dirt, disease, vice, and misery of the rat-gnawed human rookeries known as New York slums. The book deeply influenced the future New York City police commissioner Theodore Roosevelt. Novelist Theodore Dreiser used his blunt prose to batter promoters and profiteers in The Financier in 1912 and The Titan in 1914. Caustic critics of social injustice issued from other so, uh, other corners. Socialists, many of whom were European immigrants inspired by the strong movement of the state socialism in the old world, began to register appreciable strength at the ballot box. High-minded messengers of the social gospel promoted a broad band of progressivism based on Christian teachings. 
They use religious doctrine to demand better housing and living conditions for the urban poor. Feminists, in multiplying numbers, added social justice to suffrage on their list of needed reforms. With urban pioneers like Jane Addams in Chicago and Lillian Wald in New York blazing the way, women entered the fight to improve the lot of families living and working in the festering cities. So she would think back, populists, Henry Dermash Lloyd's Wealth Against the Commonwealth, Thorstein Velbin's Theory of the Leisure Class, his idea of conspicuous consumption being obvious and ostentation in your wealth, Jacob Rees's book How the Other Half Lives, the socialist movement from the immigrants, and the idea of the social gospel, what would Christians do to help the poor. So progressives began to boil up before 1900 from these roots. Raking muck with the muckrakers. You should know a couple of muckrakers uh, and what did progressives count on to right social wrongs. In what way did the muckrakers aid the cause of progressivism? Here we go. The muckrakers. Beginning about 1902, the exposing of evil became a flourishing industry among American publishers. A group of aggressive 10 and 15 cent popular magazines surged to the front, notably McClure's, Cosmopolitan, Collier's, and Everybody's. Waging fierce circulation wars, they dug deep for the dirt that the public loved to hate. Enterprising editors financed extensive research and encouraged pugnacious writing by their bright young reporters, whom President Roosevelt branded as muckrakers in 1906. Annoyed by their excessive zeal, he compared the mudslinging magazine dirt diggers to the figure in Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, who was so intent on raking manure that he could not see the celestial crown dangling overhead. Despite presidential scolding, these muckrakers boomed circulation, and some of their most scandalous exposures were published as best-selling books. The reformer writers ranged far, wide, and deep in their crusade to lay bare the muck of inequity in American society. In 1902, a brilliant New York reporter, Lincoln Steffens, launched a series of artic articles in McClure's titled The Shame of the Cities. He fearlessly unmasked the corrupt alliance between big business and municipal city government. Steffens was followed in the same magazine by Ida B. Tarbell, Ida, I'm sorry, Ada M. Tarbell, a pioneering journalist who published a devastating but factual expose of the Standard Oil Company. Her father had been ruined by the oil interests. Fearing legal reprisals, the muckraking magazines went to great pains and expense to check their material, paying as much as $3,000 to verify a single Tarbell article. Plucky muckrakers fearlessly tilted their pen lances at various targets. They assailed the malpractice of life insurance companies and tariff lobbies. They roasted the beef trust, the money trust, the railroad barons, and the corrupt amassing of American fortunes. Thomas W. Lawson, an erratic speculator who himself had made $50 million on the stock market, laid bare the practices of his accomplices in frenzied finance. This series of articles, appearing in 1905 to 1906, rocketed the circulation of everybody's. Lawson, by fouling his own nest, made many enemies among his rich associates, and he died a poor man. David G. Phillips shocked an already startled nation by his series in Cosmopolitan titled The Treason of the Senate, 1906. He boldly charged that 75 of the 90 senators did not represent the people at all but the railroads and the trusts. This withering indictment, busterous by facts, impressed President Roosevelt. Phillips continued his attack through novels and was fatally shot in 1911 by a deranged young man whose family he had allegedly maligned. Some of the most effective fire of the muckrakers was directed at social evils. The ugly list included the immoral white slave traffic in women, the rickety slums, and the appalling number of industrial accidents. The sorry subjugation of America's 9 million blacks, of whom 90% still live in the South and one-third were illiterate, was spotlighted by Ray Standard Baker's Following the Color Line in 1908. The abuses of child labor were brought luridly to light by John Spargo's The Bitter Cry of the Children. Vendors of potent patent medicines, often heavily spiked with alcohol, likewise came in for bitter criticism. These conscienceless vultures sold incredible quantities of adulterated or habit-forming drugs while doping the press with lavish advertising. Muckraking attacks in colliers were ably reinforced by Dr. Harvey W. Wiley, a chief chemist at the Department of Agriculture, who, with his famous poison squad, performed experiments on himself. Full of sound and fury, the muckrakers signified much about the nature of of the progressive reform movement. They were long on lamentation and short on sweeping remedies. To right social wrongs, they counted on publicity and an aroused public conscious, not drastic political change. They sought not to overthrow capitalism, but to cleanse it. The cure for the ills of American democracy, they earnestly believed, was more democracy. So these guys are not revolutionary per se. They want to 
expose the wrongs, shock the public, and have them vote for change and to clean the capitalist system, not get rid of it. Political progressivism. So a couple key terms you should know from this one should be the, the idea of what's called the initiative, direct primary elections, direct elections, primary elections, the referendum, the recall, um, and keep in mind that the term the Millionaires Club and this idea of what will be the 17th Amendment and women's suffrage movement. So look back at these things. Uh, we'll review pr political progressivism. Progressive reformers were mainly middle class men and women who felt themselves squeezed from above and below. They sensed pressure from the new giant corporations, the restless immigrant hordes, and the aggressive labor unions. The progressives simultaneously sought two goals. One, to use state power to curb the trusts, and two, to stem the socialist threat by generally improving the common person's condition of life and labor. Progressives emerged in both major parties, in all regions, and at all levels of government. The truth is that progressivism was less a minority movement and more of a majority mood. One of the first objectives of the progressives was to regain the power that had slipped from the hands of the people into those of the interests, the corporations. These ardent reformers pushed for a direct primary election so that undercut power-hungry party bosses. They favored the initiative so that voters could directly propose legislations themselves, thus bypassing the boss-bought state legislators. Progressives also agitated for the referendum. This device would place laws on the ballot for final approval by the people, especially laws that had been railroaded through a compliant legislature by free-spending agents of big business. The recall would enable voters to remove faithless elected officials, particularly those who had been bribed by bosses or lobbyists. So if you look, stop for a minute, these are mostly middle class people. They're fearful of the kind of revolutionary rabble below them, and they're, they're frustrated by the corporations above them. And they want more democracy. They want the people to have more say over the laws so the party bosses and the corrupt politicians can't work together. They have to listen to the people. Rooting out graft corruption also became a prime goal of earnest progressives. A number of state legislatures passed Corrupt Practices Acts, which limited the amount of money that candidates could spend for their election. Such legislation also restricted huge gifts from corporations, from which the donors would expect special favors. The secret Australian ballot was likewise be being introduced more widely in the states to counteract boss rule. Bribery was less feasible when bribers could not tell if they were getting their money's worth from the bribed. So the secret ballot. Another goal was direct election of U.S. senators became a favorite goal of progressives, especially after the muckrakers exposed the scandalous intimacy between greedy corporations and Congress. By 1900, the Senate had so many rich men that it was often sneered at as the Millionaire's Club, unquote. Too many of these prosperous salons, elected as they were uh, then were by the trust-dominated legislators, heeded the voice of their masters rather than the voice of the people. A constitutional amendment to bring about the popular election of senators had rough sledding in Congress, for the plutocratic members of the Senate were happy with existing methods. But a number of states established primary elections in which the voters expressed their preferences for the Senate. The local legislators, when choosing senators, found it politically wise to heed the voice of the people. Partly as a result of such pressures, the 17th Amendment of the Constitution, approved in 1913, established the direct election of U.S. senators but the expected improvements in caliber was slow in coming. Women's suffrage, the goal of feminists for many decades, likewise received powerful support from the progressives in early 1900s. The political reformers believed that women's votes would elevate the political tone, and the foes of the saloon felt that they could count on the support of enfranchised females. The suffragists, with their cry of votes for women and equal suffrage for men and women, protested bitterly against taxation without representation. Many of the states, especially the more liberal ones in the West, gradually extended the vote to women. But by 1910, nationwide female suffrage was still a decade away, and a suffragist could still be sneeringly defined as one who has ceased to be a lady and has not yet become a gentleman. So whilst, before we go on to the next one here, I want to pause for a second. Now, the last paragraph or section talked about more democracy, the referendum, the initiative, the direct election of senators. These are all ways for people to have more say. Um, but the next section, which is uh, points out that progressives had a lot of success at the local and state level, um, which is important to note, um, also take a look at some of their ideas and, and think about in which way are their progressive ideas more undemocratic. In other words, in what way have progressives some ways valued efficiency over democracy? 
Progressivism in the Cities and States, the local. Progressives scored some of their most impressive gains in the cities. Frustrated by the inefficiency and corruption of the machine-oiled city government, many localities followed the pioneering example of Galveston, Texas. In 1901, it had appointed expert staff commissions to manage urban affairs. Other communities adopted the city manager system, also designed to take politics out of municipal administration. Some of these reforms obviously valued efficiency more highly than democracy, as control of civic affairs was further removed from the people's hands and placed in a city manager. Urban reformers likewise attacked slumlords, juvenile delinquency, and wide-open prostitution, vice at a price, which flourished in red-light districts unchallenged by bribed police. Public-spirited city dwellers also moved to halt the corrupt sale of franchises for streetcars and other public utilities. Progressivism naturally bubbled up to the state level, notably in Wisconsin, which became a yeasty laboratory of reform. The governor of the state, Pompadour Robert M. Fighting Bob LaFollette, was an undersized but overbearing crusader who emerged as the most militant of the progressive Republican leaders. After a desperate fight with the entrenched monopoly, he reached the governor's chair in 1901. Routing the lumber and railroad interests, he wrested considerable control from the crooked corporations and returned it to the people. He also perfected a scheme for regulating public utilities while laboring in close association with experts on the faculty of the State University at, Wisc at Madison. Other states marched steadily toward the progressive camp, as they undertook to regulate railroads and trusts chiefly through public utilities commissions. Oregon was not far behind Wisconsin, and California made giant bootstrides under the stocky Hiram M. W. Johnson. Elected Republican governor in 1910, this dynamic prosecutor of grafters helped break up the dominant grip of the Southern Pacific Railroad on California politics, and then, like La Follette, set up a political machine of his own. Heavy-whiskered, Charles Evan Hughes, the able and audacious reformist Republican governor of New York, had earlier gained national fame as an investigator of malpractice by gas and insurance companies and the coal trusts. So we're taking on the corporations here, finally. Unlike the Gilded Age, you're going to finally have these people, supposedly, who will use state power to go after these corrupt corporations. Progressive women. Now, as we read this section... Um, Pay close attention to a couple of big questions. I think, one, in what way were feminists drawn to quote-unquote maternal issues, and why was this? And then decide if this Mueller versus Oregon case you're going to hear about, was it an advance or was that a setback for women's rights? We'll let you decide. So progressive women. Women moved, proved themselves in an indispensable part of the progressive army. A crucial focus for women's activism was the settlement house movement. You can look back in 565 to see more on that. At a time when women could neither vote nor hold political office, settlement houses offered a side door to public life. They exposed the middle-class women to the problems plaguing American cities, including poverty, political corruption, and intolerable working and living conditions. They also gave them the skills and confidence to attack those evils. The women's club movement provided an even broader civic entryway for many middle-class women. Literary clubs, where educated women met to improve themselves with poetry and prose, had existed for decades, but in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, many of these clubs set aside Shakespeare and Henry James for social issues and current events. Dante has been dead for several centuries, observed the president of the General Federation of Women's Clubs in 1904. I think it is time that we drop the study of this inferno and turn our attention to our own. 19th century notions of separate spheres dictated that a woman's place was in the home. So most female progressives defended their new activities as an extension, not a rejection, of their traditional roles as wife and mother. Thus, they were often drawn to moral and maternal issues, like keeping children out of smudgy mills and sweltering sweatshops, attacking the scourge of tuberculosis bred in airless tenements, winning pensions for mothers with dependent children, and ensuring that only safe food products found their way to the family table. Female activists agitated through organizations like the Women's Trade Union League and the National Consumers League, as well as through the new federal agencies like the Children's Bureau and the Women's Bureau, both in the Department of Labor. These wedges into the federal bureaucracy, however small, gave female reformers a national stage for social investigation and advocacy. Campaigns for factory reform and temperance particularly attracted women foot soldiers. Unsafe and unsanitary sweatshops, factories where workers toiled in long hours for low wages, were a public scandal in many cities. Florence Kelly, a former resident of Jane Addams' Hull House, became the state of Illinois' first chief factory inspector and one of the nation's leading advocates for improved factory conditions. In 
In 1899, Kelly took control of the newly founded National Consumers League, which mobilized female consumers to pressure for laws safeguarding women and children in the workplace. In the landmark case Muller v. Oregon in 1908, crusading attorney Louis Brandeis persuaded the Supreme Court to accept the constitutionality of laws protecting women workers by presenting evidence of the harmful effects of factory labor on women's weaker bodies. Although this argument calling for special protection for women seemed discriminatory by later standards and closed many male jobs to women, progressives at the time hailed Brandeis's achievement as a triumph over existing legal doctrine, which afforded employers total control over the workplace, employers, bosses, owners, over the workplace. The American welfare state that emerged from female activism focused more on protecting women and children than on granting benefits to everyone, as was the case in much of Western Europe with its stronger labor movements. Crusaders for these humane measures did not always have smooth sailing. One dismaying setback came in 1905 when the Supreme Court in Lochner v. New York invalidated a New York law establishing a 10-hour workday for bakers. Yet the reformist progressive wave finally washed up into the judiciary, and in 1917 the court upheld a 10-hour law for factory workers. Lochner, the term Lochnerism is often referred to as government coming down or the courts coming down on the side of, of companies rather than, than workers. So know the Mueller versus Oregon case. Women, it was okay to have female laws protecting female because of their weaker constitution, which allowed for regulation of of businesses. Uh, but the Lochner case overturned that idea, saying that you could not have a ten hour workday for general workers. Laws regulating factories were worthless if not enforced. A truth horribly demonstrated by a lethal fire in nineteen eleven at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory in New York City. Locked doors and other flagrant violations of the fire code turned the factory into a death trap. 146 workers, most of them young immigrant women, were incinerated or leapt from the 8th and ninth story windows to their deaths. Lashed by the public outcry, including a massive strike by women in the needle trades, the New York legislature passed much stronger laws regulating the hours and conditions of sweatshop toil. Other legislatures followed, and by 1917, 30 states had put workers' compensation laws on the books, providing insurance to workers injured in industrial accidents. Gradually, the concept of employer's responsibility to society was replacing the old dog-eat-dog -dog philosophy of unregulated free enterprise. Corner saloons with their shutter doors naturally attracted the ire and fire of progressives. Alcohol was intimately connected with prostitution in red-light districts, with the drunken voter, with the crooked city officials dominated by booze interests and with the blousy boss who countered poker chips by night and miscounted ballots by day, including the cemetery vote. By 1900, cities like New York and San Francisco had one saloon for about every 200 people. Anti-liquor campaigns received powerful support from several militant organizations, notably the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Founder Frances E. Willard, who would fall to her knees in prayer on saloon floors, mobilized nearly one million women to make the world homelike and built the WCTU into the largest organization of women in the world. She found a vigorous ally in the Anti-Saloon League, which was aggressive, well-organized, and well-financed. Caught up in the crusade, some states and numerous counties passed dry laws, which controlled, restricted, and abolished alcohol. The big cities were generally, quote-unquote, wet, for they had a large immigrant vote accustomed to the old country, to the free flow of wine and beer. When World War I erupted in 1914, nearly one-half of the population lived in dry territory, and nearly three-fourths of the total area had outlawed saloons. Demon rum was groggy and about to be floored temporarily by the 18th Amendment in 1919. So if you take a look at this section, uh, in what way were the feminists drawn to what they called quote-unquote uh, maternal issues, um, and also be aware of a couple uh, of key things that made legislation happen. So you could look at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, uh, which called people to action, um, and also know the Women Christians Temperance Union and their calls for prohibition and temperance. Um, one other thing, make sure you're comfortable with Mueller versus Oregon uh, and uh, Lochner versus New York. TR's Square Deal for Labor. So we're going to talk about Theodore Roosevelt, 
know or look out for Roosevelt's three C's, what they call the three C's. Um, notice the coal strike we're going to look at and the difference Roosevelt respond with his response versus the earlier presidents when there were massive labor strikes. Um, and all this adds up to the question, why was Roosevelt considered a progressive? And in what ways was his administration different from those of the Gilded Age? This is Roosevelt represents a massive shift, uh, you could argue, from the earlier Gilded Age presidents to now his administration, which plays a slightly different role or pretty big different role. Theodore Roosevelt, although something of an imperialistic busybody abroad, was touched by the progressive wave at home. Like other reformers, he feared that the public interest was being submerged in the drifting sea of indifference. Everybody's interest was nobody's interest. Roosevelt decided to make it his. His sportsman instincts spurred him into demanding a square deal for capital, labor, and the public at large. Broadly speaking, the president's program embraced three C's control of the corporations, consumer protection, and conservation of natural resources. Control of corporations, consumer protections, and conservation of natural resources. Control, consumers, and conservation. The Square Deal for Labor received its acid test in 1902 when a crippling strike broke out in the anthracite coal mines of Pennsylvania. Some 140,000 besuited workers, many of them illiterate immigrants, had long been frightfully exploited and accident-plagued. They demanded, among other improvements, a 20% increase in pay and a reduction of the working day from 9 to 10 hours. Excuse me, from 10 to 9 hours. Unsympathetic mine owners, confident that a chilled public would react against the miners, refused to arbitrate or even negotiate. One of their spokesmen, multimillionaire George F. Baer, reflected the high and mighty attitude of certain ungenerous employers. Workers, he wrote, would be cared for, quote, not by the labor agitators, but by the Christian men to whom God in his infinite wisdom has given control of the property interests of this country. As coal supplies dwindled, factories and schools were forced to shut down, and even hospitals felt the icy grip of winter. Desperately seeking a solution, Roosevelt summoned representatives of the striking miners and the mine owners to the White House. He was profoundly annoyed by the extraordinary stupidity and bad temper of the wooden-headed gentry who operated the mines, the owners. As he later confessed, if it had not been for the dignity of his high office, he would have taken one of them by the seat of his breeches and chucked him out the window. Roosevelt finally resorted to his trusty big stick when he threatened to seize the mines and operate them with federal troops. Faced with this first-time-ever threat to use federal bayonets against capital, Rather than labor, the owners grudgingly consented to arbitration. A compromise decision ultimately gave the miners a 10% pay boost and working day of nine hours, but their union was not officially recognized as a bargaining agent. Keenly aware of the mounting antagonisms between capital and labor, Roosevelt urged Congress to create the new Department of Commerce and Labor. This goal was achieved in 1903. Ten years later, the agency was split in two. An important arm of the newborn cabinet body was the Bureau of Corporations, which was authorized to probe businesses engaged in interstate commerce. The Bureau was highly useful in helping to break the stranglehold of monopoly in clearing the road for the era of what's called trust busting. So in what way was Roosevelt different than the other presidents before him, uh, and why might he be considered a progressive? And uh, this is a hint. Think of the way Rutherford B. Hayes responded to the railroad strike of 1877, and Cleveland responded to the Pullman strike in 1893. In both cases... Cleveland and Hayes uh, sent out troops to force the workers back to work and break the unions. In this case, labor, um, sorry, um, the federal troops were used by Roosevelt to threaten the corporations and to help the labor unions. TR corrals the corporations. The sprawling railroad occupy was sorely needed restraint. The Interstate Commerce Commission, created in 1887 as feeble as a feeble sop to the public, had proved woefully inadequate. Railroad barons could simply appeal the commission's decisions on rates to the federal courts, a process that might take 10 years. Spurred by the former cowboy president, Congress passed an effective railroad legislation, beginning with the Elkins Act of 1903. This curb was aimed primarily at the rebate evil. Heavy fines could now be imposed both on the railroads that gave rebates and on the shippers that accepted them. Still more effective was the Hepburn Act of 1906. Free passes, with their hint of bribery, were severely restricted. The once infantile Interstate Commerce Commission was expanded, and its reach was extended to include express companies, sleeping car companies, and pipelines. For the first time, the commission was given real molars when it was authorized, on complaint of shippers, to nullify existing rates and stipulate maximum rates. <laughs> 
Railroads also provided Roosevelt with an opportunity to brandish his antitrust bludgeon. Trust had come to be a fighting word in the Progressive Era. Roosevelt believed that these industrial behemoths, with their efficient means of production, had arrived to stay. He concluded that there was good trust and with public consciousness, and there were bad trusts, which, limited, which lusted greedily for power. He was determined to respond to the popular outcry against the trusts, but was also determined not to throw out the baby with the bathwater by indiscriminately smashing all large business. He was okay with large companies as long as they were, were what he called good trusts with public consciousness. Roosevelt, as a trust buster, first burst into the headlines in 1902 with an attack on the Northern Security Companies. This is a railroad holding company organized by financial titan J.P. Morgan and empire builder James J. Hill. These Napoleonic moguls of money sought to achieve a virtual monopoly of the railroads in the Northwest. Roosevelt was therefore challenging the most regal potentates of the industrial aristocracy. The railway promoters appealed to the Supreme Court, which in 1904 upheld Roosevelt's antitrust suit and ordered Northern Securities companies to be dissolved. The Northern Securities decision jolted Wall Street and angered big business, but greatly enhanced Roosevelt's reputation as a trust smasher. Roosevelt's big stick crashed down on other giant monopolies as he initiated over 40 legal proceedings against them. The Supreme Court in 1905 declared the Beef Trust illegal, and the heavy fist of, inju- of justice fell upon monopolists controlling sugar, fertilizer, harvesters, and other key products. Much mythology has inflated Roosevelt's reputation as a trust buster. The Rough Rider understood the political popularity of monopoly smashing, but he did not consider it sound economic policy. Combination and integration, he felt, were the hallmarks of the age, and to try to stem the tide of economic progress by political means, he considered the rankest folly. Bigness was not necessarily badness, so why punish success? Roosevelt's real purpose in assaulting the Goliaths of industry was symbolic, to prove conclusively that the government, the government, not private business, ruled the country. He believed in regulating, not fragmenting, the big business combines. The threat of disillusion, he felt, might make the sultans of the smokestacks more amenable to federal regulation, as it did. In truth, Roosevelt never swung his trust-crushing stick with maximum force. In many ways, the huge industrial behemoths were healthier, though perhaps more tame at the end of Roosevelt's reign than they had been before. His successor, William Howard Taft, actually busted more trust than T.R. did. In one celebrated instance, in 1907, Roosevelt even gave his personal blessing to the J.P. Morgan's plan to have U.S. Steel absorb the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company without fear of antitrust reprisals. When Taft then launched a suit against U.S. Steel in 1911, the political reaction from T.R. was explosive. So pause for a minute. Just know that T.R. is known as a trust buster, but he actually was not against the trust, the monopolies. He just was against what he thought were bad trusts. And he wanted to prove conclusively that the government, not corporations, ran the country. And I think you should be able to use the Northern Securities case as an example of that. Caring for the consumer. Now, as we look, look for the, the idea of Upton Sinclair in his book called The Jungle and note a couple of acts that were passed that were meant to help consumers and keep them safe. But I'd like you to, as we read this, consider if the above consumer protections that I just mentioned helped or hurt large corporations. Caring for the Consumer. Roosevelt backed a noteworthy measure in 1906 that benefited both corporations and consumers. Big meat packers were being shut out of certain European markets because some American meat, from the small packing houses, claimed the giants, had been found to be tainted. Foreign governments were even threatening to ban all American meat imports by throwing out the good beef with the bad botulism. At the same time, American consumers hungered for safer canned products. Their appetite for reform was whetted by Upton Sinclair's sensational novel The Jungle, published in 1906. Sinclair intended his revolting track to focus attention on the plight of the workers in big canning factories, but instead he appalled the public with his description of disgustingly unsanitary food products. As he put it, he aimed for the nation's heart but hit the stomach. The book described the noxious detail of the filth, disease, and putrefaction in Chicago's damp, ill-ventilated slaughterhouses. Many readers, including Roosevelt, were so sickened for a time that they found meat unpalatable. The president was moved by the loathsome mess in Chicago to appoint a special investigation committee, whose cold-blooded report almost outdid Sinclair's novel. It related how piles of poisonous rats, rope ends, splinters, and other debris were scooped up and canned as potted ham. A cynical jingle of the time ran, Mary had a little lamb, and when she saw it sicken, shipped it off to Packingtown, and now it's labeled chicken. 
Backed by a nauseated public, Roosevelt introduced Congress to pass the Meat Inspection Act of 1906. It decreed that the preparation of meat shipped over state lines would be subject to federal inspection from corral to can. Although the largest packers resisted certain features of the act, they accepted it as an opportunity to drive their smaller fly-by-night competitors out of business. At the same time, they could receive the government seal of approval on their exports. As a companion to the Meat Inspection Act, the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906 was designed to prevent the adulteration and mislabeling of foods and pharmaceuticals. Earth control. Before we read this, a couple of things to look out for. Again, um, notice the difference between conservationists versus preservationists. And also keep in mind of this idea of the closing of the frontier we talked about earlier. And how did the notion of the closing of the frontier support Roosevelt's conservation policies? All right. Wasteful Americans, assuming that their natural resources were inexhaustible, had looted and polluted their incomparable domain with unparalleled speed and greed. Western ranchers and timbermen were especially eager to accelerate the destructive process, for they panted to build up the country and the environmental consequences be hanged. But even before the end of the 19th century, far-visioned leaders saw that such a squandering of the nation's birthright would have to be halted, or America would sink from resources, resource richness to despoiled dearth. A first feeble step towards conservation had been taken with the Desert Land Act of 1877, under which the federal government sold arid land cheaply on the condition that the purchaser irrigate the thirsty soil within three years. More successful was the Forest Reserve Act of 1891, authorizing the president to set aside public forest as national parks and other reserves. Under this statute, some 46 million acres of magnificent trees were rescued from the lumber's man saw in the 1890s and preserved for posterity. The Cary Act of 1894 distributed federal land to the states on the condition that it be irrigated and settled. A new day in the history of conservation dawned with Roosevelt. Huntsman, naturalist, rancher, lover of the great outdoors, he was appalled by the pillaging of timber and mineral resources. Other dedicated conservationists, notably Ginford, Gifford Pinchot, head of the Division of, of Forestry, uh, had broken important ground before him. But Roosevelt seized the banner of leadership and charged into the fray with all the weight of his prestige, his energy, his first-hand knowledge, and his slashing invective. The thirst of the desert still unslacked, Congress responded to the whip of the Rough Rider by passing the landmark Newlands Act of 1902. Washington was authorized to collect money from the sale of public lands in the Sunbaked Western states and then use these funds for the development of irrigation projects. Settlers repaid the cost of reclamation from their now productive soil, and the money was put into the revolving fund to finance more such enterprises. The giant Roosevelt Dam, constructed on Arizona's Salt River, was appropriately dedicated by Roosevelt in 1911. Thanks to this epical legislation, dozens of dams were thrown across virtually every major western river in the ensuing decades. Roosevelt pined to preserve the nation's shrinking forest. By 1900, only about a quarter of the once vast virgin timberlands remained standing. Lumbermen had already logged off most of the first-growth timber from Maine to Michigan, and the sharp thud of their axes was beginning to split the silence into the great fir forest of the Pacific Slope. Roosevelt proceeded to set aside in Federal Reserve some 125 million acres, or almost three times the acreage thus saved from the saw by his three predecessors. He similarly earmarked millions of acres of coal deposits as well as water resources useful for irrigation and power. To set a shining example, in 1902, he banned Christmas trees from the White House. Imagine conservatives talking about that now. Conservation, including reclamation, may have been Roosevelt's most enduring tangible achievement. He was buoyed in this effort by an upwelling of national mood and of concern about the disappearance of the frontier, believed to be the source of such national characteristics as individualism and democracy. An increasingly citified people worried that too much civilization might not be good for the national soul. City dwellers snapped up Jack London's Call of the Wild in 1903 and other books about nature, and urban youngsters made the outdoor-oriented Boy Scouts of America the largest youth organization. The Sierra Club, founded in 1892, dedicated itself to preserving the wilderness of the western landscape. The preservationists lost a major battle in 1913 when the federal government allowed the city of San Francisco to build a dam for its municipal water supply in the spectacular high-walled Hetch Hetchy Valley of Yosemite Park. The Hetch Hatch Alley, the Hetch Hetchy controversy, laid bare a deep division among conservationists that persists to the present day. To the preservationists of the Sierra Club, including famed naturalist John Muir, Hetch Hetchy was a temple.
temple of nature that should be held inviolable by the civilizing hand of humanity. But the conservationists, among them President Roosevelt's chief, for, chief, chief forester Gifford Pinchot, believed that wilderness was waste. Pinchot and Roosevelt wanted to use the nation's natural endowment intelligently. In their eyes, they had to battle on two fronts, against greedy commercial interests who abused nature, as well as against romantic preservationists enthralled to simple woodman spare the tree sentimentality. Under Roosevelt, professional foresters and engineers developed the policy of multiple-use resource management. They sought to combine recreation, sustained yield logging, watershed protection, and summer stock grazing on the same expanse of federal land. At first, many Westerners resisted the federal management of natural resources, but they soon learned how to take advantage of new agencies like the Forest Service and especially the Bureau of Reclamation. The largest ranchers and timber companies in particular figured out how to work hand-in-glove with federal conservation programs devoted to the rational, large-scale, and long-term use of natural resources. The one man and one mule logger, or the one man and a dog sheep herder, had little clout in the new resource bureaucracy. Single-person enterprises were shouldered aside in the interest of efficiency by the combined bulk of big business and big government. So if you look back, did these agencies help or hurt big corporations? In the end, many historians argue that it helped big corporations. The Roosevelt Panic of 1907. Roosevelt was handily elected president in his own right in 1904 and entered his new term buoyed by his enormous personal popularity. The cuddly teddy bear honored one of his bear hunting exploits when he saved the life of a cub, and children piped vigorously on whistles modeled on his famous teeth. Yet the conservative Republican bosses considered him as dangerous and unpredictable as a rattlesnake. They grew increasingly restive as Roosevelt in his second term called ever more loudly for regulating corporations, taxing incomes, and protecting workers. Roosevelt, meanwhile, had partly defanged himself after his election in 1904 by announcing that under no circumstances would he be a candidate for a third term. Now, this was a tactical blunder, for the power of the king wanes when the people know he'll be dead in four years. Now remember, he, came, he was elected uh, once. Before this, he would be his president because McKinley was shot and he was the vice president. So he could run again and not really break tradition. <clears throat> the financial world hastened to blame Roosevelt. No, I'm sorry. Let's go back up. Roosevelt suffered a sharp setback in 1907 when a short but punishing panic descended on Wall Street. The financial flurry featured frightened runs on banks, suicides, and criminal indictments against speculators. The financial world hastened to blame Roosevelt for the storm. It cried that this quack had unsettled industry with his boat-rocking tactics. Conservatives damned him as Theodore the Meddler and branded the current distress the Roosevelt panic. The hot-tempered president angrily lashed back as his critics when he accused certain malefactors of great wealth of having deliberately engineered the monetary crisis to force the government to relax its assault on trusts. Fortunately, the panic of 1907 paved the way for long-overdue fiscal reforms. Precipitating of currency shortage, the flurry laid bare the need for a more elastic medium of exchange. In a crisis of this sort, the hard-pressed banks were unable to increase the volume of money in circulation, and those with ample reserves were reluctant to lend out their less fortunate competitors. Congress in 1908 responded by passing the Aldridge Vreeland Act, which authorized national banks to issue emergency currency backed by various kinds of collateral. The path was thus smooth for the momentous Federal Reserve Act of 1913. The Rough Rider thunders out. Still warmly popular in 1908, Roosevelt could easily have won a second presidential nomination and almost certainly the election, but he felt bound by his impulsive post-election promise after his victory in 1904. The departing president was thus naturally sought a successor who would carry out my policies. The man of his choice was amiable, ample girthed, and huge-framed William Howard Taft, Secretary of War and a mild progressive. As an heir apparent, he had often been called upon in Roosevelt's absence to sit on the lid, all 350 pounds of him. At the Republican Convention of 1908 in Chicago, Roosevelt used his control of the party machinery, the steamroller, to push through Taft's nomination on the first ballot. Three weeks later in Mile High Denver, in the heart of Silver Country, the Democrats nominated twice-beaten William Jennings Bryan. The dull campaign of 1908 featured the rotund Taft and the now-balding boy orator, both trying to don the progressive Roosevelt mantle. Both of them were trying to be the progressive Roosevelt. The solid Judge Taft read cut-and-dried speeches while Bryan gripped, griped that Roosevelt had stolen his policies from the Bryanite camp. 
A majority of voters chose stability with Roosevelt and Doris Taft, who polled 321 electoral votes to 162 for Bryan. The victor's popular count was 7,675,320 to 6,412,294. The election's only surprise came from the socialists, who amassed 420,793 votes for Eugene V. Debs, the hero of the Pullman strike of uh, 1894. Roosevelt, ever in the limelight, left soon after the election for a lion hunt in Africa. His numerous enemies clinked the glasses while toasting health to the lions, and a few irreverently prayed that some big cat would do his duty. But T.R. survived, still bursting with energy at the age of 51 in 1909. Roosevelt was branded by his adversaries as a wild-eyed radical, but his reputation as an eater of errant industrialists now seems inflated. He fought many a sham battle, and the number of laws he inspired was certainly not in proportion to the amount of noise he emitted. He was often under attack from the reigning business lords, but the more enlightened of them knew what they had a friend in the White House. Roosevelt should be remembered first and foremost as the cowboy who started to tame the bucking bronco of adolescent capitalism, thus ensuring its long life. T.R.'s enthusiasm and perpetual youthfulness like an overgrown Boy Scout's appeal to the young of all ages. You must always remember, a British diplomat cautioned his colleagues, that the president is about six. He served as a political lightning rod to protect capitalists against popular indignation and against socialism, which Roosevelt regarded as ominous. He strenuously sought the middle road between unbridled individualism and paternalistic collectivism, like socialism or communism. His conservation crusade, which tried to mediate between the romantic wilderness preservationists and the rapacious resource predators, was probably his most typical and most lasting achievement. Several other contributors of Roosevelt lasted beyond his presidency. First, he greatly enlarged the power and prestige of the presidential office and masterfully developed the technique of using the big stick of publicity as a political bludgeon. Second, he helped shape the progressive movement and beyond it the liberal reform campaigns later in the century. His square deal, in a sense, was the grandfather of the New Deal, later launched by his fifth cousin, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Finally, to a greater degree than any of his predecessors, T.R. opened the eyes of Americans to the fact that they shared the world with other nations. As a great power, they had fallen heir to responsibilities and had been seized by ambitions from which there was no escaping. Taft a round peg in a square hole. William Howard Taft, with his ruddy complexion and upturned mustache, at first inspired widespread confidence. Everybody loves a fat man, the saying goes, and the jovial Taft, with his mirthquakes of laughter bubbling up from his abundant abdomen, was personally popular. He had graduated second in his class at Yale and had established an enviable reputation as a lawyer and judge, though he was widely regarded as hostile to labor unions. He had been a trusted administrator under Roosevelt, in the Philippines, at home, and in Cuba, where he had served capably as a troubleshooter. But good old Will suffered from lethal political handicaps. Roosevelt had led the conflicting elements of the Republican Party by the sheer force of his personality. Taft, in contrast, had none of the arts of a dashing political leader and none of Roosevelt's zest for the fray. Recoiling from the clamor of controversy, he generally adopted an attitude of passivity towards Congress. He was a poor judge of public opinion, and his candor made him a chronic victim of foot-and-mouth disease. Peaceful Bill was no doubt a mild progressive, but at heart he was more wedded to the status quo than to change. Significantly, his cabinet did not contain a single representative of of the party's insurgent wing, which was on fire for reform of current abuses, especially the tariff. The dollar goes abroad as a diplomat. Though ordinarily lethargic, Taft bestirred himself in the use of the lever of American investments to boost American political interests abroad, an approach to foreign policy that his critics denounced as dollar diplomacy. Washington warmly encouraged Wall Street bankers to sluice their surplus dollars into foreign areas of strategic concern for the U.S., especially in the Far East and in the regions critical to the security of the Panama Canal. By preempting investors from rival powers such as Germany, New York bankers could thus strengthen American defenses and foreign policies while bringing further prosperity to their homeland and to themselves. The almighty dollar thereby supplanted the big stick. China's Manchuria was the object of Taft's most spectacular effort to inject the reluctant dollar into the Far Eastern theater. Newly ambitious Japan and imperialistic Russia, recent foes, controlled the railroads of the strategic province. 
President Taft saw in the Manchurian Railway Monopoly a possible strangulation of Chinese economic interests and a consequent slamming of the open door in the faces of U.S. merchants. In 1909, Secretary of State Philander C. Knox blunderingly proposed that a group of American and foreign bankers buy the Manchurian railroads and then turn them over to the Chinese under a self-liquidating arrangement. Both Japan and Russia, unwilling to be jockeyed out of their dominant position, bluntly rejected Knox's overtures. Taft was showered with ridicule. Another dangerous new trouble spot was the revolution-riddled Caribbean, now virtually a Yankee lake. Hoping to head off trouble, Washington urged Wall Street bankers to pump dollars into the financial vacuums in Honduras and in Haiti to keep out foreign funds. The United States, under the Monroe Doctrine, would not permit foreign nations to intervene and consequently felt obliged, or obligated, sorry, to put its money where its mouth was to prevent economic and political instability. Again, necessity was the mother of armed Caribbean intervention. Sporadic disorders in Palm Front, Cuba, Honduras, and the Dominican Republic brought American forces to these countries to restore order and protect American investment. A revolutionary uphill in Nicaragua, regarded as perilously close to the nearly completed Panama Canal, resulted in the landing of 2,500 Marines in 1912. The Marines remained in Nicaragua for 13 years. Traft the Trust, bust, trust Buster Taft managed to gain some fame as a smasher of monopolies. The ironic truth is that the colorless Taft brought 90 suits against the Trust during his four years in office, as compared to some 44 for Roosevelt in seven and a half years. By fateful happenstance, the most sensational judicial actions during the Taft regime came in 1911. In that year, the Supreme Court ordered the dissolution of the mighty Standard Oil Company, which was judged to be a combination in restraint of trade in violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. At the same time, the court handed down its famous rule of reason. This doctrine held that only these combinations that unreasonably restrained trade were illegal. This fine print proviso ripped a huge hole in the government's antitrust net. Even more explosively, in 1911, Taft decided to press an antitrust suit against the U.S. Steel Corporation. This initiative infuriated Roosevelt, who had personally been involved in one of the mergers that prompted the suit. Once Roosevelt's protege, President Taft was increasingly taking on the role of his antagonist. The stage was being set for a bruising confrontation. Taft splits the Republican Party. Lowering the barriers of the formidable protective tariff, the mother of trusts, was high on the agenda of the progressive members of the Republican Party, and they at first thought that they had a friend and ally in Taft. True to his campaign promises to reduce tariffs, Taft called Congress into special session in March of 1909. The House proceeded to pass a moderately reductive bill, but since senatorial, senatorial reactionaries led by Senator Nelson Aldridge of Rhode Island tacked on hundreds of upward tariff revisions, only items such as hides, sea moss, and canary birdseed were left off the duty-free list. After much hand-wringing, Taft signed the payne Aldred bill, thus betraying his campaign promises and outraging the progressive wing of his party, heavily drawn from the Midwest. Taft rubbed salt in the wound by proclaiming it the best bill that the Republican Party ever passed. Taft revealed a further knack for shooting himself in the foot in his handling of conservation. The portly president was a dedicated conservationist, and his contributions actually equaled or surpassed those of Roosevelt. He established the Bureau of Mines to control mineral resources and rescued millions of acres of western coal lands from exploitation and protected water power sites from the private development. But those praiseworthy accomplishments were largely erased in the public mind by the noisy ballinger pinchot quilt quarrel that erupted in 1911. I'm sorry, 1910. When the Secretary of the Interior, Richard Ballinger, opened public lands in Wyoming, Montana, and Alaska to corporate development, he sharply criticized, he was sharply criticized by Gifford Pinchot, chief of the Agricultural Department's Division of Forestry, and a stalwart Rooseveltian. When Taft dismissed Pinchot on the narrow grounds of insubordination, a storm of protest arose from conservationists and from Roosevelt's friends, who were legioned. The whole unsavory episode further widened the growing rift between the president and the former president, one-time bosom political partners. The reformist wing of the Republican Party was now up in arms, while Taft was being pushed increasingly into the embrace of the stand-pat old guard. By the spring of 1910, the grand old party Republican was split wide open, owing largely to the clumsiness of Taft. A suspicious Roosevelt returned triumphantly to New York in June of 1910, and shortly thereafter stirred up a, a, a tempest. <laughs> 
Unable to keep silent, he took to the stump at Osawatomie, Kansas, and shocked the old guard with a flaming speech. The doctrine that he promoted or proclaimed, popularly known as New Nationalism, urged the national government to increase its power to remedy economic and social abuses. Weakened by these internal divisions, the Republicans lost badly in the congressional elections of 1910. In a a victory of landslide proportions, the Democrats emerged with 228 seats, leaving the once-dominant Republicans with only 161. In a further symptom of the reforming temper of the times, a socialist representative, Austrian-born Victor Berger, was elected from Milwaukee. The Republicans, by virtue of holdovers, retained the Senate 51 to 41, but the insurgents in their midst were numerous enough to make that hold precarious. The Taft-Roosevelt Rupture The sputtering uprising in Republican ranks had now blossomed into full-fledged revolt. Early in the 1911, the National Progressive Republican League was formed, with a fiery white main Senator LaFollette of Wisconsin its leading candidate for the Republican presidential nomination. The assumption was that Roosevelt an anti-third termer, would not permit himself to be drafted. But the restless Rough Rider began to change his views about third terms as he saw Taft hand in glove with the old, hated old guard, discard my policies. In February 1912, Roosevelt formally wrote to seven state governors that he was willing to accept the Republican nomination. His reasoning was that third term tradition applied to three consecutive terms. Uh, exuberantly, he cried, my hat is in the ring, and the fight is on and I'm stripped to the buff. Roosevelt forthwith seized the progressive banner, while LaFollette, who had served as a convenient pathbreaker, was protestingly elbowed aside. Girded for battle, the Rough Rider claimed clattering into the presidential primaries, then being held in many states. He shouted through half-clenched teeth that the president had fallen under the thumb of the reactionary bosses, and that although Taft means well, he means well feebly. The once-genial once Taft, now in a fighting mood, retorted by branding Roosevelt supporters emotionalists and neurotics. A Taft-Roosevelt explosion was near in June 1912 when the Republican convention met in Chicago. The Roosevelt lights were uh, about a hundred delegates short of winning the nomination, challenged the right of some of the 250 Taft delegates to be seated. Most of these contests were arbitrarily settled in favor of Taft, whose supporters held the throttle of the convention steamroller. The Roosevelt adherents cried fraud and naked theft, and in the end refused to vote, and Taft triumphed. Roosevelt, the supposedly good sportsman, refused to quit the game. Having tasted for the first time the bitter cup of defeat, he was now on fire to lead a third-party crusade. So a few things to close on. Thinking back on Teddy Roosevelt's presidency, in what way might it be argued that Roosevelt saved capitalism, actually, rather than hurting it, despite what the popular belief is? Uh, And what are some of the key reasons, if you look back, for the Taft-Roosevelt rupture? 